Good morning. Our first reading comes from Job, chapter 30, verses 11 through 19. Because God has loosed my bowstring and humbled me, they have cast off restraint in my presence. On my right hand, the rabble have rise up. They send me sprawling and build roads for my ruin. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. No one restrains them. As though a wide breach they come. Amid the crash they roll on. Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind. And my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of my affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With violence he seizes my garment. He grasps me by the collar of my tunic. He has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 5. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and then done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Good morning. Our readings continue with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And from Matthew chapter 11, then he, Jesus, began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Before we continue, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord our God, we are grateful for your presence. We are thankful for your grace and for the forgiveness that is available in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for your word and for the readings of today. Thank you for this time of Lent in which we are able to reflect upon our own lives, our own sinfulness, our own mortality. And so may the messages we hear, and specifically today, 
go straight to our hearts and may we be transformed by your word. We ask that your spirit will do that with us and in us this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So before I get started, um, <clears throat> for this time of Lent, I'm going to invite you to be a little more active, I guess, during some of or most of the messages to make it a little bit more experiential for you. And so today as we focus on ashes, I'm first going to ask the elders, two elders to come forward that I've talked to, <clears throat> and then uh, I'll explain what we're going to do further. So uh, Kame and Christina, if you could come forward. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an ash, cross of ashes on the top of their hands. And I'm going to invite Kame to do the same for me. Thank you. And they're going to stand on each side, and I'm going to invite you, if you so... Uh, if you're willing, of course, to come forward, um, receive some of the ashes on your hand, and then just go sit down again. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to do that. So just a few days ago, <clears throat> it was Ash Wednesday, this past Wednesday, and I'm sorry that I was unable to be here uh, for the beginning of Lent with you, but I, I, I'm thankful to the elders uh, and some of the deacons who uh, took the lead and, and made sure that the service continued. Now, Ash Wednesday, of course, is the beginning. It signals the beginning of this year's Lent. And when we place ashes on our foreheads in the shape of a cross, it serves as the first external reminder that Lent has come. And the Lent, the journey of Lent, is a 40-day period of confession and contrition and repentance. It's an annual reminder that as a follower of Christ, I must die to myself. And so for those of us who are baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus, the ashes are a sign of confession, a sign of repentance, of suffering, and really our own mortality. Because when God first confronted Adam in the Garden of Eden after the fall into sin, he immediately reminded Adam that just as he came from the dust of the ground, so his body would become dust again in death. Adam and Eve were once created perfectly, but now they would die because of the fact that they disobeyed God's command. And as their descendants, we also speak those same words when we impose the ashes. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Because you see, the reality is that we all die. The last time I uh, checked the mortality rate in the USA, it was at 100%. So we all eventually die because we're all born into sin. It's like King David said in the Old Testament in Psalm 51, Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. He says, I've sinned and done wrong since the day that I was born. And so we need to be aware of our own sin nature and the fragility and the brevity of life. Nothing is guaranteed. And that is why we should actually welcome the season of Lent. It's an important season, and it's a healthy annual 
spiritual practice for us because it truly implores us to take off the old clothing of sin, as I explained to the children, in order that we may be clothed anew by Jesus Christ. And so the ashes of Ash Wednesday and the ashes on your hands today are a powerful reminder that we were made from dust and to dust we will return. Now, if you look at the Bible, you will see the evidence of ashes all over. Job covered himself with ashes because of his grief and shame. Jeremiah reminds us of ashes in the book of Lamentations. Ezekiel preached that cities such as Tyre would repent in dust and roll in ashes. Isaiah warned God's people about idolatry and worshipping wooden idols. And he said, one who worships them feeds on ashes. In Esther chapter 4 verse 1, Mordecai mourns for the people of God, tearing his clothes and putting on dust and ashes after he hears about the murderous edict of the king and his servant Haman. Later, after Jonah, remember Jonah, preached to the city of Nineveh, the king and all the people mourned in dust and ashes. And in today's gospel lesson, Jesus does not hide from ashes, but urges the Galilean cities of Chorazon, Bethsaida, and Capernaum to repent, to dress in sackcloth, and put ashes on their heads. So you see the ashes you wore if you were here on Wednesday on your forehead and the ashes I'm talking about today remind you of your sin. Your sin. Just as Nineveh sinned and repented in dust and ashes, many others repented after God's prophets preached to them. After God's word touched their lives. And so for this year's Lent, I'm doing a series of messages called Promised Treasures. It's based on material by Concordia Publishing House. And if you don't have the booklet yet, like I mentioned before, there might be one or two left. Make sure you pick up one. Because each Sunday during Lent and Good Friday and Easter Sunday as well, I will highlight an ancient, visible, and biblical object. And these objects, like the ashes today, will hopefully impress upon you and help you understand who you are in Christ Jesus and what God has done to save us. And some of these objects are common in our daily lives today. But maybe as we focus on these objects during Lent, you will look at them differently. And hopefully, they will enable you to better appreciate your history as the people of God and your daily need for Jesus Christ. And maybe these messages will somehow remain with you just a little bit longer because the physical elements we're going to utilize will serve as a powerful reminder of the messages. And so today we sit and we clothe ourselves in dust and ashes, just like Job did. I'm not sure how much you know about Job's story, by the way. So let me tell you just a little bit more about him. God blessed him with a large family. He had a wife, seven sons, and three daughters. He owned a lot of land. He had numerous people who worked for him. He had thousands and thousands of animals. He was one of the wealthiest people in the East in those days. He was like a modern-day Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. 
And somehow, God allowed it all. Or he allowed it and he almost, all his possessions were taken from him in one fell swoop. Imagine that. Everything gone. And God permitted Job's body to be so deeply afflicted with boils and sores from the bottom of his feet to the crown of his head that he literally scraped his scabs and skin with a piece of pottery just to get some relief. It was so bad, and he had lost so much that even his wife said to him in desperation, why do you still trust God? Why don't you just curse him and die? I don't know if, uh, if you've ever been in such a desperate situation and place in your life that, that you would actually curse God and just want to die. But what I do know is that we all suffer in this world. We all suffer. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. We all suffer. And if you haven't, by the way, you will at some point. Paul in the Bible says to the Philippian congregation and to Timothy that all Christians suffer. Now some of our sufferings and trials are worse than others. Some are less serious and consequential. Sometimes we are the cause of our own suffering. You make a bad choice or you do something stupid and you suffer the consequences. Or because you were selfish, you maybe hurt or injured someone or other people and now they do little to help you. And sometimes it has nothing to do with you and you suffer because of what other people do. Because we live in a fallen and sinful world and Sometimes our suffering is a result of the actions or evil of others. And because sin touches us in all these different ways and is part of our post-paradise experience, so does death. It affects us all. Our grandparents die. Our parents die, our children die. Other loved ones lose their lives and perish. And so we all sit in ashes with Job, really, and others in the Bible who suffered. And maybe what we need to remember is what Martin Luther said on his deathbed before God. He said, we're all beggars. This is true. Like the beggar who asked Jesus to heal him and make him see again and be well. We need Christ to open our eyes and give us his grace. And for that to happen, we need to be repentant. And we need to seek his forgiveness. And we need to recognize that every, every blessing we enjoy and every blessing we possess is not because we deserve it. It's only a gift from God's almighty hand. The good news, however, for a believer is that being baptized into Christ's death and his suffering is more than only wearing ashes. Jesus promises to also raise you from the ashes of your death and the grave. And he assures you of eternal life. That is what he promised Martha when her 